today's video, I'm not alone. I invited Tin, who is Vietnamese overseas, so Viet Q, and he decided to relocate to Vietnam. Tin has a very interesting background because he used to be a FBA agent uh, working for the secret force in the US, and now he's the CEO of a cybersecurity company. So in today's video, we're going to go through his journey relocating from the US to Vietnam and what he's doing right now as the CEO of uh, cybersecurity companies. Let's get started. Hi, Tin. I'm very happy today to have you on the show to discuss about your journey. Can you start by introducing yourself uh, to our audience? Sure. Uh, my name is Tin. I'm a Vietnamese American. Um, you know, I typical immigrant story in that uh, my parents, because of the war, immigrated to the U.S. Uh, via Bangkok, where I was born. Uh, grew up in the United States, and I've been back in Vietnam now for about uh, four years, and uh, currently in the cybersecurity industry. Okay, interesting. So how was that journey relocating from the U.S. to Vietnam uh, exactly? Uh, incredible. Um, I, I can tell you as a former um, government employee and military officer that um, the past few years being in Vietnam, being in private business uh, has been the most um, challenging, but yet, you know, personally developing uh, moments for me. So if we can come back a little bit about that transition moment. So you used to be an FBA uh, agent and then you transitioned to be a CEO. How was that transition personally and then also on the, on the professional plan? Yeah, so, uh, you know, kind of alluding to my previous point in the, in the difficulty of that and the challenges of that. You know, when you are working within a government organization or the military, when you start working with new people, they're trained because there's regulations, policies, and there's a pipeline to train people that you work with. However, you know, with entrepreneurship within the private industry, you got to have a lot of patience because now you're training young employees, young team members, and you're mentoring them, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy within the government and the military that doesn't always exist with uh, private organizations. And so it's learning how to navigate personalities and that new business culture that um, has made it a challenging but very rewarding experience. Very interesting uh, team. And actually, recently, there's been the focus on your current company, the Cybersecurity One. Uh, you guys helped the FBI to figure out uh, what happened about uh, Axie Infinity in Vietnam. So see, this is a play to earn a crypto um, company that has been um, done by a Vietnamese company. And then basically there have been a 625 million US dollar loss, right? So can you come back to what happened and how you guys help the FBI? Sure. So uh, last March 2022, um, Axie Infinity, a very popular blockchain game, uh, was hacked. And so immediately that as it happened, um, they gave a call to my partner and I and said, hey, we need your help with this, right? Because they're a unicorn, um, they're a large company, but their focus is on gaming, not security, right? And so they needed our help to basically come in, figure out what happened, and basically help them coordinate the effort in the recovery and the investigation, because it's not in their wheelhouse. Yeah. So the reason the FBI got involved, even though it's a Vietnamese company, is because there's stakeholders in the United States. And as an international event, there's a lot of players from a lot of different jurisdictions internationally, whether you're talking about um, crypto exchanges and wallets, you're talking about investors, you're talking about uh, law enforcement agencies and government, right? So even here in Vietnam, they, they had to get involved. And so it was a matter of one, find, helping them find out what happened exactly and how the, the bad guys did it. And then collecting enough information to be able to pass on to the authorities and those who do the forensics to dive down into who did it, where did they come from? What were their motives? And so really for, for us, it was about coordinating that effort between the international law enforcement agencies and the government to include the FBI. 
Okay, interesting. And can you give a little bit uh, more detail about where is right now the investigation and the last uh, news that you, you got? Sure. So, um, you know, obviously this is still an ongoing investigation and it does take a little time for everything to be published, uh, what can be published anyway. However, you know, the things that I will rehash um, will be just the kind of the methodology and who did it, right? Because it was released very shortly after um, it happens that it was North Korean. They call it an Advanced Persistent Threat, an APT, which is an organization that is linked to the government, right? Now, so the state sponsored. They will never say like, oh yeah, this is our, our, our hacker group, of course, but we generally know that this is the case, yeah. And so we knew this happened, um, and we knew that the techniques that they took were generally something called social engineering, which is the manipulation of the employees and the team members. So what they did was they sent messages through LinkedIn, and they had people messaging them here on the ground in Vietnam as well. So it's a combination of social media, it's a combination of people messaging them through messaging apps here in Vietnam, but yet they're Koreans. So these groups are very complicated, very complex, very structured and organized, because it's not just a bunch of nerds sitting in a room someplace typing on a computer. It's people in the country that they're targeting, right? It's people setting up months and months and background stories um, so that they can talk to you through social media. Yeah. Interesting, uh, Tin. So your company is in Singapore. You have an office in Vietnam as well. You are the CEO located here. Uh, how is it right now to run a business? Uh, you, you mentioned that, of course, there are some uh, things that are not always um, as straightforward as your previous military career here. You have to train a team. You probably work with people that are 25 years old, etc. right? Geeks that are very good, but also on the managing aspect is challenging. What was the, the three main uh, things that you could point out about doing business in Vietnam? Sure. So I think um, the first and foremost is that business is good in Vietnam, right? A lot of opportunity. I mean, that's, that's why I came back here as, as a Viet Gio, um, just because there's a lot of opportunity to succeed in many different industries. And so that opportunity still exists, even post-COVID, it's still exploding here. And so I think this is the same sentiments that a lot of people who are doing business in Vietnam will echo, is that there's a lot of opportunity. However, right, on the flip side of that, if you're a young entrepreneur coming to Vietnam with a startup, you can't just be a copycat. So a lot of people, what they used to do was try to take an idea from the US, from Europe, and then bring it here to Vietnam and just basically replicate it. But what they're not thinking about are cultural considerations, different social considerations, why that wouldn't work, or why investors wouldn't be interested in that. For example, like Uber. Uber failed here, even though Uber is a giant you know, in the rest of the world. Why? It's because they failed to have certain considerations like cash is king in Vietnam. Everyone pays by cash. Uber wanted to mandate that people pay by card. Right? And so these, these small nuances like that uh, are, are what make the difference. Okay, so a lot of things to do if you are a Viet Thu, you learn the language, for instance, or, the, or just someone who has already experience into running a company overseas, you could consider uh, coming to Vietnam. You mentioned some of those downsides. What is it in terms of um, the managing aspect? Do you find it challenging to, to, to manage a team here because you are the, the CEO of that company? Um, I would say it does have its certain challenges, but it's nothing that, as long as you're open-minded, that you can't overcome. Because they're, you know, I'm Vietnamese American, right? And so they understand that I at least understand their culture to a certain extent. I speak the language to a certain extent. I'm not gonna tell you that I'm fluent, right? However, from a personal standpoint, I also need to make the effort to be more Vietnamese because we're in Vietnam. Uh, I think one of the issues that some Viet Gieu have is their ability to kind of blend back into the culture here. You know, they don't really care about learning the language, which, which I think is a mistake, honestly, right? As a Viet Gieu, when I came back, I was very embarrassed by the fact that I couldn't speak as fluently as I wanted to. And so it's been a, it's been a challenge, but a really rewarding experience about re-engaging my, my culture. Um, but you know, I think the local populace, local employees, take very well to VQ for the most part, you know, as long as you're respectful and understanding. The same principles that you should hold within any um, managed position or leadership position anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. And so you mentioned about the cultural aspect as a VQ to come back to Vietnam. What are for your um, understanding the main misconception and misunderstanding that some Viet Qs may have about Vietnam today? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, first and foremost, I think the same thing that uh, a lot of professionals will probably tell you is about um, your, your cost of living and your, your salary, right? I think a lot of Viet Qs, whether you've been gone for a long time and are now coming back, or 
um, you just went for school and you're coming back, a lot of the times you make the assumption that, hey, I've been abroad, I have this international experience, I can come back and make a high salary. Slow down, right? Not always the case, right? You could if you have the right opportunity, but I would say you need to slow down and, and reevaluate because uh, you're in Vietnam, right? The cost of living here is different. Even international companies that are here scale their salaries down so that it matches the, the, the local rates a little more. Yeah, so that would be one, yeah. Okay, so cost of living will be different. Uh, is there other things that VQ have some assumption just because also maybe their family, right? Yeah. How you got raised overseas and how your parents left Vietnam for certain reasons and then now sometimes they may not understand why you want to come back. Uh, do you have this in your family or, or friends around or other sure. VQs? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think there are a lot of assumptions that are made about the lifestyle in Vietnam and where we are because face it, my parents, a lot of the other parents of, of the other VQ, they left Vietnam like 40, 50 years ago which is a, a long time if you really think about it. So they left about 40 years ago and they haven't been back. So all the thoughts they have about Vietnam are from when they were here, from, from the war. And so those remain. And so even when I was coming here, I had an aunt say, hey, make sure you don't date any girls from the North. And it's, it's funny because they, they believe that the North and South are still fighting. But if you talk to any of the, the youth here, it's just history. That's all it is, right? And so there's a lot of thoughts about um, conflict, Um, so when your VQ come back, you know, I think there are some thoughts about how the North and South interact, about how modernized Vietnam is. I was very pleasantly surprised when I, you know, was here and realized that there's, food-wise, I could get any cuisine I wanted, basically, right? So it's very international, modernized, contemporary. So there are business opportunities in Vietnam. Let's say, again, if you come back with a foreign experience, VQ, uh, it's also easy to set up a company in Vietnam when you can compare to other places in the region. For instance, in Vietnam, as a foreigner, you can own uh, 100% of the share. And of course, if you are VQ and you can get back your uh, citizenship, you can set up a local company. So it's also uh, more easy to set up and also easy to maintain. Do you have other pros and cons about doing business and investment in Vietnam? Sure. Uh, you know, as a tech guy, I can speak to tech. You know, as one of the greatest opportunities here is, is starting a tech company within any of the industries. We're talking about, you know, human resources or food and beverage, you know, cybersecurity, manufacturing, um, finance. There's a lot of fintech and, and other types of platforms now that are being developed in Vietnam. And so what that means is there's talent here, right? The, the amount of talent within all these industries across types of product development, engineering, uh, whether it's blockchain, whatever the case may be, is exploding. But the con to that and the downside to that is that it's getting more competitive. And so companies are fighting for that same small pool of resources. And then you're also fighting international companies that are coming in and trying to scoop up this talent for a fraction of the cost of what they would be paying people in the US. right? Um, and so in that regard, it's, it's becoming more challenging for startups because we have to compete against the salaries that are being offered by international companies or larger startups from the US. Um, and so, you know, pro, you've got a lot of great talent here. Con, everyone's fighting for the same resources. Mm. Okay, interesting thing. Actually, if you want to learn more about this, you have another video that we made with a, a French person involved into an outsourcing company. So he, it's exactly what uh, Tim described here. You can easily find talents here. You can hire them for six months, one year, but because they are chased by a lot of companies locally and also internationally, it's quite hard to retain and to uh, keep uh, that labor force for your company. Uh, what about your, your, your next upcoming months and, and journey in the next years uh, now as a CEO? What's your plan, uh, projects or things that you want to scale up uh, about your cybersecurity company? Yeah, so right now, you know, I actually just started a fundraising round, a seed round, uh, not too long ago. And so my, my immediate focus is uh, bringing cash into the company, right? Because, well, that's the lifeblood of the company. Uh, but, but what that allows me to do, obviously, is to just grow my team. And so it's the focus on growing my team and my product. And then through that, being able to provide a service to the community of Vietnam, which is why I got into cybersecurity to begin with. So I understood, Tin, uh, with your journey coming back to, the, to Vietnam, you want to have a kind of legacy here and leave something that can really tighten uh, you even more to the country. Um, how people can reach you out or learn more about what you are uh, doing? Sure. So, you know, obviously I have a website for my company. It's uh, polarisec.com. And uh, if people want to learn more about what we do, uh, you know, it, it takes five seconds to take a look. And then, uh, honestly, we actually offer services for free 
to the public as well through my website. And so uh, if you're interested in learning about how you can get started in your cybersecurity journey or uh, learning more about what you can do to prepare yourself to uh, avoid and deter attacks, please reach out to us through the website. That's uh, polarisec.com. Okay, very good guys. So uh, thanks team. Uh, we will leave everything below in the description. So if you guys want to learn more about cybersecurity, uh, we have a lot of tech guys here. We also run, we have our own website. So I'm sure some, some people would want to check a little bit uh, if they are not doing some mistake that may ruin or at least uh, expose them to some potential hackers. So you can find everything below in the description. Thanks, Tin, again for your time today. Uh, if you enjoy the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up. If you are Viet Q considering coming back to Vietnam, check below as well and leave us your thoughts, your comments, and we can interact and discuss about that. Thanks, Tin, again. Thank you. And I see you in the next video. Bye bye, guys. And I'ma get it right, dead on sight like